have always confused me. At any rate, before I start this morning, I have failed to do something all week. So if I, had, if I don't do it when I'm supposed to do it, I have to do it at an inappropriate moment. Uh, Mr. McElveen, would you please help us today with the collection? Thank you. I was supposed to have called you all week, and I just failed to do it, and I'm, and I'm sorry. At any rate, I remind you that Thursday of this week uh, is a holiday of obligation. It is a feast of the ascension of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And uh, for those who absolutely cannot come to Mass on that day, uh, you know, the usual uh, uh, practice is to spend at least one hour during that day in prayer and meditation. So I wish you would be very conscientious about that. And I fail to put in the bulletin uh, that tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday are rogation days. And those are days of very special prayer uh, placed in the calendar just before the ascension of our Lord. And they are of not only prayer, but days of penance and mortification. They're no longer days of fast and abstinence, but uh, days of special penance uh, for not only our own benefits, but for the benefits of the crops. Now, we know very well that today the situation concerning crops is not quite the same as it was when this was enacted. For in those days, individual men, individual families depended so on the success of their crops. Today, crops have fallen into the hands of big business, and uh, you have to at least uh, say these prayers with proper application. And perhaps that proper application would be that your, the, the work of your own hands, whatever it may be, will be successful before God. And that you will be able, that we will be able to, uh, to give to our families that which we have earned by the labor of our own hands. Now that doesn't matter what that labor today is, if it is good labor. So during these days, uh, we will have the, the litany of the saints, and for those who come to Mass in the mornings, the, the litany will start at 5.30 in the morning, and we will process out and in. So the, this was supposed to have been in the bulletin, but it failed to make its appearance. So tomorrow morning and Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning, uh, before Mass, uh, we will have the litany of the saints uh, processing to the, up the road and back, um, <clears throat> at 5.30 in the morning. I wish also to make a report, brief indeed. Uh, as you know, we had a, a getting together, if I use that word, of priests, bishops, and all over the world during this past week. And uh, nothing, that we didn't come together to approve anything or decide anything or to put anything in motion, but simply to have these men from the various parts of the world to come together and exchange views and exchange ideas and ideals uh, as they see them manifested throughout the world. And I certainly wish to at least make this observation that when we think that we here in this country are the center of the way things are done, look again. Because we, uh, the, the other countries of the world, do not think like we do, do not speak like we do, do not act like we do. They do not have the same uh, uh, ideas, ideals as we have. And when then, when you take that into consideration, <clears throat> and the condition in which the church finds itself today, you really have a hodgepodge. And we have to be, one thing we have to be very careful about, and that is 
that our religion is accurate, that we have, a, uh, that we have uh, probably because of that that I was inspired, we have a quotation in today's bulletin, the faith crisis in the Roman Catholic Church today cannot bear the continuing burden of defective religious thinking. That is so destructive and so unsettling. And also the, uh, the introductory uh, little uh, essay today uh, has to do with these sort of things. We have been thinking in terms of prayer for a long time and we shall continue to think in terms of prayer for a long time. The laity is unquestionably dependent upon what their priests tell them. The laity, and this of course is not being said in disregard, it's only normal. The laity are not the professionals. Just as the laity are not the professionals in the medical circles. If I were a well-read individual in matters of medicine, and I knew what the books had to say, and I uh, traveled through the books and uh, wrote articles even concerning such things, would you permit me to operate on you for appendicitis? I hardly think so. I might know all about how the knife is to be directed. Isn't that wonderful? But would you put the knife in my hands to cut upon you? I hardly think so. And so it is with matters of religion the priest is supposed to be the professional. He is the one that has been trained, that has been put through the mill, that has been a novice, who has, been, who has had on-the-job uh, activity. And matters of the mind are far more delicate and far more intricate than an operation on the body, believe it or not. But unfortunately, <clears throat> too many today have, because of their exposure to information, have developed certain ideas and ideals concerning their religious life, concerning uh, a prayer concerning the, the living of religious life. And they come up with their own centralized, uh, erroneous, defective thinking concerning things, matters of religion. And unfortunately, their priests, in many cases, have led them up that alley. Because the priests themselves, it has come to be have been trained by men who have either forgotten or by men who are themselves just out of the classroom. And you know the old adage, you simply cannot give what you don't have. And so people are confused and they have a wrong notion of what it means to be holy. They have a wrong notion of what one must do to be holy. And they come up with the idea sometimes, erroneously, that necessarily, if one goes about with an extremely holy uh, uh, aura around him, that that's a holy man. It doesn't follow. 
doesn't follow at all. Always remember the poor Pharisee who came up to the temple to pray. He had all of the holy looks that are required uh, of anybody. As a matter of fact, he dripped with holiness all the way from the front door to the altar. And he reminded Almighty God of how absolutely wonderful he was because he didn't commit sin and he didn't rob and he didn't curse and he didn't swear and he didn't do all of the other bad things that bad people do, especially like that one in the back of the church who shouldn't even be allowed to come inside this building. He should be thrown out. But he was rejected, wasn't he? And the poor little man in the back of the church that the Pharisee wanted to throw out. In his humility and in his sorrow for his sin and in his feeling of compunction, sorry because he had injured and hurt his God who loved him so much. All he could do was to squeeze his way in the front door and looking up to heaven, simply said, I'm sorry. And he went home justified. See the difference? You see the big difference. You see the huge difference. My beloved people, we have to be careful. Now, I'm not saying this about you or us, but I am saying it to anyone that it, it may apply. We cannot afford to be church goers. A church goer is compelled to go to church on Sunday. He is compelled to bring out his prayer book. He is compelled to put on his holy clothes whenever holy clothes are in order. And that's precisely what the Pharisee did and was rejected. We have to know, we have to comprehend who we are dealing with. And we have to understand that that individual does not read our minds, but he reads our hearts. And what comes out of our heart is what we are. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So any of the things that we do must come from the fact that they are generated and nourished in our heart. And we have to have accurate information. I don't mean trivia. I'm not concerned about Catholic trivia. The first thing that people present to us for consideration is the catechism. Fine, God forbid that I should say a word against the catechism. I've taught it myself over and over and over and over again and have gotten in trouble over and over and over again because I did that. But the Catholic Catechism, it comes a time in one's life when one has to take the Catholic Catechism and put it aside. Because the Catholic Catechism is mostly for beginners. The Catholic Catechism, the Baltimore Catechism, tells me what I must do. And that's fine. That's its purpose. That's its intention. But the Catholic Catechism does not tell me how. And it's the how 
that we have to go after. Today, with the computer as it is, with this whatever else they call you, push a button and you can get all the references you want for this or that or the other. And we are certainly a well-informed generation, no question. But my dear people, has information made us holier? Has all of this available information done anything to make us holier? To make us more acceptable to God? I've told you over and over again, Satan is the foremost scholar of sacred scripture. Nobody, nobody except Christ himself, nobody, possibly the Blessed Mother, but I kind of doubt it, nobody has the same kind of complete knowledge of scripture as Satan has. Satan has the book memorized from the first word to the last. Doesn't he? Has this knowledge made Satan holy? And so we must be careful that we do not think or act rather with the dictates of our mind but rather with the dictates of our hearts. And we have to understand what that requires of us. That means that we have to change. We have to turn radically and completely. And today, all kinds of things, all kinds of things are thrown at us by all kinds of people and the laity is the victim of all these things. I'm not saying that God has inspired us to come here with infallible knowledge. I'm not saying that at all. The only thing that I say is not only to you, but to us up here, that our information is accurate and that it isn't based on my personal opinion. Opinions, you can have them. Everybody has an opinion. But finally, the opinion has to give in to accuracy. And it's been this lack of accuracy and this overwhelming uh, influence of personal opinion that has put our church in the chaotic condition that we find it today. And it's gotten to the point where anyone and everyone does not know who to believe, does not know who to trust. And they have wonders perhaps, maybe Jesus himself played some tricks in some of the things that he said. So my beloved people, we cannot afford defective religious thinking. We've been going along with this for many years now. It went wild over about 30 years ago. And even prior to that, defective thinking was already creeping in. Defective. I remember distinctly, because we used to have a monthly uh, clerical conferences. And at these conferences, the priests discussed matters that pertain, priest matters, uh, the sacraments, sin, and stuff of that in, in nature. And I remember on one occasion, the subject came up about one breaking one's fast before receiving Holy Communion. In those days, you will recall that the fast began at midnight. And 
<coughs> usually people went to Mass at 6, 8, or 10, whatever time it was. The question came up about brushing one's teeth before going to communion. Should one brush one's teeth before going to Holy Communion? And the question was more or less answered, well now, if some of the toothpaste gets mixed up with the saliva and one inadvertently swallows it, he should not go to communion. Would you not classify that as defective religious thinking? And it went on and on and on. And that opened the door. Those ideas that were incorrect were gradually, gradually, imperceptibly, gradually cracking <coughs> the front door, which let in vapors that have destroyed all of it. And the very ones, I know them. I know who they are. I lived with them. I talked to them. The very, very same ones that once upon a time said, if you brush your teeth before communion and you have an idea that the, a little bit of toothpaste gets mixed up with the saliva and you swallow it, therefore you cannot go to communion, those very same ones today are saying, don't bother, that's a bunch of baloney. Don't, you don't have to go to confession. You don't have to work. Go ahead and eat a hamburger on your way into the church door. But go to communion. You see what can happen. My beloved people, we have to know what we do. We have to be convinced of what we think of and so on. We're getting ready now for the Feast of the Holy Ghost. Let us pray, and we're going to start our novena here on Friday night of this coming week. Let us pray that Almighty God will not only through the merits of the, through the instruments of the Holy Ghost to give us the grace to understand, the gift of understanding, the gift of piety and all the gifts and fruits but that he will give this to all. And those of us we know, and we all maintain to be holding on to the truth. We have condemned our Protestant brothers and sisters and friends and relatives and sons and daughters all these years because each church has a different way of putting it. Have it are we not doing the same thing? And we call ourselves holy Catholic people. You go to this one, he says two and two makes four, which is true. You go to this one, he says two and two makes six, which is true to him. Go to the next one, two and two makes 23, which is true. And we have confusion. But if all of us and we of the traditional bent are trying our best to say two and two equals four here, now, and in all places and all times, then why do we argue? There's no point of argumentation there. So let us come to an understanding of what it is to love God. Let us put aside all defective thinking to the best of our human abilities. And before we get up to make dogmatic statements, and some of us are guilty of making dogmatic statements, let us make sure that the dogma behind what we say is accurate and true. Then confusion will be put down, put down, put down, rather than made to run rampant. So my beloved people, 
this is one of the times I was going to speak for about three minutes, but I made it a, didn't work out that way. So it lasted a little longer. But at any rate, God bless you. God keep you. We pray for you. You pray for us. And in so doing, let us give praise, honor, and glory to the only being that exists that makes sense. And in so doing, also, we will cut the chains that have kept us bound for all these years to uncertainty, to self-will, to disobedience, to pride, and such like. Pride is a fire that never goes out unless we stomp on it with the vigor that is required by God himself. God bless you.